welcome to the Sifu Mimi Chan Show. Thank you so much for joining us for this special AAPI Heritage Month podcast that is streaming live on Facebook. It's actually the first time I've uh, done a live stream for my podcast, so this is super exciting, and this is the best occasion to do it because I have some awesome ladies with me that are going to be speaking with you later. Um, as many of my listeners know, one of the ways I suggest we honor AAPI heritage is by learning and asking questions about the culture. So this is exactly what I intended to do by inviting this panel here today so that I can learn more about other Asian cultures because um, it is such a diverse community and it's so extensive that I'm excited to just kind of delve in and, and learn a lot more. Um, I'm also hoping this will be an ongoing feature for my show so I can continue to explore and learn about these different cultures. And so hopefully every month or every two months, I'll be having a panel such as this um, to just kind of be able to bring that uh, culture and exposure to all of the different amazing uh, countries in Asia. So uh, my first episode specifically, though, I wanted to showcase these amazing AAPI women community leaders. Uh, they have accomplished so much in their careers, but they also give back to the community. And this also gave me an excuse to have happy hour with the ladies. So I encourage everybody to sit back and relax and enjoy this conversation. For those of you on Facebook Live, feel free to type in questions. Uh, let me know if you, uh, you know, have a question for us or, or if you just think we're the most awesome, please share that information. We love to hear about it. Uh, and if, if there are questions, we'll definitely try to get to it. Uh, and I just wanted, again, thank this amazing panel that you guys are all about to meet. Uh, it's It's been crazy. We have all been on AAPI panels. We have all been activists in the community uh, regarding all of the issues surrounding the anti-Asian hate crimes and the challenges that this community has been facing. And while, of course, that is all extraordinarily important, the fight will continue. Um, for this hour, I really wanted to focus on sharing the positive and fun things about our culture. So it will be a bit of a departure from the heavy issues hence the happy hour theme, but, um, but basically we are just here to share and enjoy and, and, and just relax and have a good time talking to one another. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce my lovely, lovely panel and we'll go alphabetical by last name. We're going to start with Anchanto. Hi, Shifu Mimi. Thank you so much for inviting me and being part of this panel with these phenomenal ladies here. Uh, we already have some dates planned to hang out all the way up in Massachusetts. So I'm really excited about that. All about food and learning about different cultures. So hi, everyone. My name is Anchanto Am Jamburipsua. I'm Cambodian, also known as Khmer, um, practicing attorney here in Central Florida, uh, president of the Greater Orlando Asian American Bar Association, and also the vice president and chief legal officer for Empower Inc., which is a nonprofit organization here providing services for children's and family here um, dealing with substance misuse, mental health, adoptions, and the whole gamut. So i um, really excited to be here. I'm going to pass it back to you, Mimi. All right. Thank you so much, An. And now I take it to my do all the way up in Massachusetts. Good evening, everybody. So delighted to be a part of this wonderful panel with uh, these beautiful ladies and um, to hear to and learn from everybody um, about their different cultures and heritage and um, what they bring to the American society as as um, as AAPI uh, female leaders. So uh, what an honor. Um, rất cao, chào các bạn, rất uh, vui có thể uh, ở đây nói chuyện với uh, sư phụ Mimi, uh, nói chơi về uh, người Việt Nam và um, uh, người Việt Nam ở Mỹ uh, ở ra sao. Um, so I'm very, um, very, very happy um, to um, to be able to share our Vietnamese. Uh, I'm Chinese from Vietnam, but the Vietnamese aspect of, of our heritage here. And uh, I am um, a martial artist uh, learning under Walam uh, Kung Fu system. So Sifu Mimi is actually my Kung Fu uncle. Um, and um, and uh, when I'm not practicing Kung Fu and Tai Chi, I'm a community activist. So I serve on five different boards, uh, primarily advocating for Asian Pacific American um, uh, rights and um, and uh, social justice, equity, inclusion work. Um, so very, very, uh, very delighted to be here and can't wait for all the conversation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mai. And now to Leah. Hi, Mimi. Ma thank you so much for having me here. Um, and I'm so glad and honored to be a part of this panel as well. Um, so, kumosta? 
magandang gabi po, which means um, hello and good evening very formally in, in the Philippines, and that's where I'm from. I am an attorney here in Orlando with Shepard Smith, Colmeyer in Hand, where I focus on intellectual property and the defensive class actions filed by consumers. Um, I'm also involved with uh, five or six different uh, nonprofit organizations where um, we do focus on um, Asian Americans, also social justice, women's rights, and the federal bar. <laughs> so, um, and I'm also um, a part of my HOA community. So, very involved and so happy to be here. Awesome. Thank you so much. And last but certainly not least, Tali. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Mimi, for having me here. Um, Oi, to the bang and uh, Kambawa. That would be my half Japanese and half Brazilian languages. Um, yeah, I am so excited to be here. Uh, my name is Tali Sugizawa, and I work for Fusion Fast, which is a nonprofit project with the goal of bringing all the many different cultures together. We say that our mission is to celebrate the people and the many different cultures that make Central Florida awesome. So that's that's our, our mission. And um, I'm a mom, I have a 10 year old, 10 year old daughter and uh, I moved here to Central Florida six years ago, straight from Brazil what, where I was born and raised and super excited to, you know, even if it's just a small difference, making a small difference in the world. Excellent. And, and that you definitely do. Okay. I am so excited to have you all here. I don't even know where I want to begin, but since you all opened up with all these beautiful languages, I will, I will represent um, my Chinese and Jamaican side. So I can say ni hao or ni ho or wakwan in, ja in, in Batwa. So, uh, and that's something I have in common with Tali actually, where we have a very mixed background and we'll get into that, but I would love to hear a little bit more about the languages. Cause of course, um, for Chinese, you have Cantonese, Mandarin, and beyond that, so many different dialects. And I don't know if that's the same in other cultures. And so I would love to hear if there's differences, um, whether it's because from the North or the South, you hear um, accent changes, or if there are actually different languages, because I should have done my research, but uh, I didn't. Uh, but uh, maybe my knows how many Chinese dialects there are, but there's a lot, <laughs> but obviously Cantonese and Mandarin being the two most popular um, in the Chinese culture. But um, maybe we can start with Mai with that, with um, Vietnamese. I know that you you um, speak several languages, actually, you're multilingual, but what about in uh, Vietnam? Are there different dialects there or um, is it just more of a, an accent? I would say it's more of an accent. Uh, there are very clear distinctions from, uh, from um, um, uh, folks, you know, living in the north and the south, and also the the middle of the country, Hue, um, most of the time. Um, so, um, if if they're from the north, like you can hear the Hanoi accent, um, and if they're the south, like you can hear the Saigon or the Ho Chi Minh City accent. Um, and if if they're in the in the mid mid uh, part of the country, you you'll hear the Hue accent. And sometimes they're so strong that you can't even make out what they're saying, but the written language is the same. Uh, wow. But, you know, for the most part, if, if, if we try and listen hard enough, maybe, you know, we can make out some things. Um, very, very different, though. Um, the accent is very strong. So um, for me, my family is from uh, Ho Chi Minh City or what we used to call, you know, Saigon, you know, pre pre um, 1975. Right. So um, um, their accent is, is, is very it's, it's very kind of it doesn't have the draggy, you know, strong accent to that. So um, I can tell right away if people are from the south, the north or the mid <laughs> part of the country. Yeah, I think that that's awesome. Because um, as you know, we, we've gone to China several times on tours and everything. And while my Mandarin is, is getting better, it's still limited in certain parts where they say they're speaking Mandarin, I still have no clue because the dialect and the accent is so different. It just depends on what village you're from. And I find language so fascinating, especially because because um, my all my I, I I don't feel like I even have any of them in full. Like I'm not a hundred percent. Even my English I feel needs. I help. feel but, the same you, way, right? Like everything way. is like small percentages, and so I just find it fascinating. So on, what is it like um, in Cambodia? 
Well, it's very similar to my, we, we have, it's Khmer, the language, but it depends on certain areas of where you live. If you look closer to say Vietnam, there's a Vietnamese, Cambodian, Khmer mixture to it. So that you might have that drawl, you might have that twang to it and it's a little different. So it's interesting because when I speak my Khmer to my, um, my family members, they say that I have the American <laughs> twang to it. So uh, it's really interesting to hear that, but they still understand what I'm saying. It's just that they, they notice that there's a different um, way of saying it. It's, it's just like saying if you are Puerto Rican, New York, or you're Puerto Rican from the island, there's a different tone mm -hmm. or um, uh, texture to it. So um, there's a lot of that going on because the Cambodia borders so many different countries and we have such an influx of different cultures as well. You got the Thai culture, you got the Laotian, you even got Hmong, Chinese and Vietnamese. So we're a huge mix. So to say that you're Cambodian, sometimes I'm like, I want to take a DNA test because <laughs> you know what you really are. And my, actually my brother did take a DNA, um, the what is it? The 20? Yeah, 23 and me. And he's probably watching this right now going, don't tell them. <laughs> or he's like, tell them that I'm European. <laughs> Something really spicy. Um, he's not. So <laughs> unfortunately he's not um, to his liking, unfortunately. But, um, but that's the language that we um, speak. And my father um, has his own, because he's from the countryside, whereas my mother was from the city. So there was also a different pronunciation of certain words. And also my father father only had a second grade education. So that also played a role in it, especially when you're the caretaker of the family of, I, I want to say 12 sisters um, wow. and living uh, in a prairie's um, you know, countryside and um, the living is uh, growing, harvesting rice and um, taking care of your cattle. So that is, that shows a difference of dialect as well. So, right. Um, that's just my my take, my experience from my parents. Excellent. Wow. That is, that is so insightful and fascinating really. And a really quick detour of the 23 and me, I took the test as well. And it turns out I'm 99% Chinese <laughs> and 1% like Southeast Asian or something. So um, I was, I felt pretty ripped off about that test because, you know, my husband got it and his color map was like every color and mine was one. And I was like, okay, I'm pretty pretty pure Chinese there. So anyways, all right, Leah. So uh, there's approximately uh, like 175 dialects in the Philippines. And, um, and it's all kind of what you guys mentioned, it's based on region. Mm -hmm. So my parents were born in um, the country or the island of Luzon, which is um, in the near the capital of Manila. And so they um, also within that region, um, were born in Papanga. So they speak Papangan and also the national language, which is Tagalog and English. And they also speak um, a mixture of both Tagalog and English, which they call Taglish. So they speak Papangan, Taglish, Tagalog, and English. And I just speak English, <laughs> so, unfortunately. Wow, I had no idea there was that many dialects. And so is it, is it, cause I know when like what Maya and An was saying, it's like very, the dialect or is more of an accented thing. So for example, in Chinese, like you can't understand someone if you only speak Mandarin, you don't understand Cantonese, there's no back and forth, but is there some semblance of understanding across all those different dialects or is it really pretty, pretty variant? Yeah, they're pretty, there's some words that are similar, but it's all um, the most, you know, the, the, the language that everyone speaks is Tagalog, but yes, mm -hmm. it's totally a different wow. language. Like there's a, um, you know, there's a Lacano, there's um, Papangan. So that's, there's so many different variations. It's so interesting. Wow. That is fascinating. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, Tali. <laughs> Uh, well, I grew up speaking Portuguese. That's my native language. And interesting fact is that most um, people from my generation that were born and raised in Brazil, they don't speak Japanese. They speak like the vocabulary is vast. We know many words, but unfortunately we don't really speak the language. And that's because when the first uh, Japanese immigrants immigrated to Brazil, they were forbidden to speak the language. Like speaking your a foreign language was not allowed. It was like a military dictatorship and um, World War II was going on. So they could not speak Japanese at all. In fact, um, they built like little schools around the, uh, like the farmers that, the farms that they were working at and those schools were all burned, even like books and all. So we kind of grew up um, 
like just speaking Portuguese and with, a, a, I mean, several uh, Japanese words in it. But uh, my mom is also, was also the first Brazilian in my dad's family. Um, and it, it was so interesting because today, probably my mom speaks better Japanese than my dad because um, she had to learn, right? Because she was with everyone else. She was like the outsider. And because of that, they would, when they were around her, they would just speak Japanese. And she was like, oh, okay, fine, I'll learn. So um, that's, um, that's very interesting. So in, in Brazil, in Portuguese, I would say there's a lot of, um, again, accents. My husband is from like the kind of like Southeast side and I'm from the South. We speak completely different accents. Yeah. Um, the, the R especially, I will say like, I pronounce the R like R and he pronounces the R like, like when the airy <laughs> sound. So it is funny with our daughter because depending on who she spends most time with during the week, she catches on that accent. So wow. it's, it's pretty interesting. I love that. And, and actually the next question, the next category or two what, that I wanted to go through, actually I want to stick with you there because as I mentioned earlier, even though I'm 99% Chinese, I, I am very in touch with my Jamaican culture because my mom was born and raised in Jamaica here in Orlando, mm-hmm. Florida, all of my family around me is the Jamaican side. And so none of my cousins here speak Chinese. I'm like the only one because of my father. And so right. really we are always in Patois. We do a lot of the Jamaican culture. And so obviously we know because we're in communities where literally Asians are all over the world. They're all throughout the Caribbean. They're all throughout Latin America, but you probably get it a lot where people are so surprised that you oh are Brazilian because you yeah. look like you're Japanese. And we've met a lot of Japanese Brazilians and at tournaments and, and events and, and martial artists yeah. and stuff. So I know yeah. there's a huge population. And so my next question was kind of about that immigration, whether a, if for the whole panel, you know, if you were born here, if not, what was kind of your parents journey here um but for you tally you know obviously like you're you're you were born in brazil you mentioned so kind of what was yeah. your journey to uh, america like and and having that kind of diaspora of that that, right. that mix yeah i know i feel like i and this is what i always share when i talk about my heritage i growing up mixed in brazil i never really felt like i belonged so like in my family i was the mixed one like the brazilian And then with my friends at school, I was the Japanese. So I kind of, I was like, I I really don't know what I am. I never really felt like belonging to one culture or another because I always had people reminding me that I was just not quite Brazilian or I was just not quite Japanese. So it was really a a struggle. I, I laugh today, but like growing up, it is just so hard not finding your identity yeah. and just, you know, and I don't look anything like my mom. So uh, all my cousins on my mom's side, when we went out, they would always, people would always ask if I was the friend and they, my cousins were, you know, the daughters or the sons. And I'm like, this is so unfair. <laughs> um, so my journey coming here moving here really is rooted in this, in not really finding my identity in Brazil and just wanting to be someplace else where I could just be, you know, just, just whatever, another <laughs> Asia or, you know, um, yeah, without being questioned, right. my, be- my belonging, you know, and I feel like that's why I, I love working with what I work now, because my main goal is to make feel, is to make people feel like they're welcome and they belong no matter where they come from. Yeah, that's so beautiful. And basically, you literally came to the melting pot. You chose America for that reason, I'm guessing. Yeah. And did you come yeah. straight to straight, straight to Florida from Brazil? Straight to Orlando. Yeah, okay. I. So when I was ten years old, kind of, I went to Disney for the first time, and I I was just in awe because, of course, you see people from all over and yes. different languages. So. That was my plan at 10 mm-hmm. years old, my, the age my daughter is now. Well, one day I'm just going to move to Orlando because there's people from all over <laughs> looking yes, like, you know, definitely. so different from <laughs> Yeah. Well, you were scouting out the country at 10 years old. I love it. I love it. All right. So <laughs> Leah, thank you so much for sharing that. Leah, what was, um, were you born here? And if so, like, what was, the, what's the lineage? Sure. No, so I was born in Aganya, Guam. Um, so 
Um, and then I moved to California when I was three and I, my parents uh, and my grandparents all lived in Guam and my parents met in Guam. And so they eventually uh, moved to California because I think the midpoint between Philippines and, and the US is Guam. <laughs> so they all live there. I still have family there. And we ended up moving to um, California because my parents were just so big in education and following the American dream that that's what they wanted us to achieve. My mom, um, she had, um, she went to college in the Philippines and my dad, he was an orphan. He grew up very poor and he went to, he lived with his cousin um, growing up and he went to college and it wasn't like you had student loans or anything. They had, my dad said he worked like three jobs while he went to college and then finished that. And my cousin who he ended up living with uh, most of his life, he, Artemio Villasenor, he ended up being um, the chief justice of the Supreme Court of the Philippines. And so, um, you know, we came here to the um, America and then um, again, my parents instilled a lot of like education in the American dream. It was my sister and I, and my sister ended up going to Berkeley and then Harvard Med. So, and I went to the Harvard of the South at FAMU College of Law. <laughs> so, you know, it just, um, that's just, that was the most important for them and yeah. what they wanted us to achieve. Yeah, I, I resonate with that as well, because, um, you know, my parents coming from the countries they're from, you know, China and Jamaica, it's like they wanted to provide that life that they couldn't have, right? They didn't have the same opportunity to go to college or have that education. So I definitely, we, a, us Asian Americans in this, this <laughs> panel, I'm sure can all resonate with our parents wanting us to study and do well in school. <laughs> all right, exactly. um, on tanto. Yes, so um, my parents actually met at a refugee camp when they escaped the Khmer Rouge during a time of turmoil and um, right around uh, the 70s. Um, they, they met uh, crossing their own ways over the border from Cambodia to Thailand. And from there, they, um, they met each other, fell in love, and they um, had my brother Chunburi, who happened to be born in Chunburi, Thailand. And, um, from there, they were sponsored by a church to come to America. And the reason why my parents really wanted to come over, not only to escape the, the war-torn country, but also the fact that there was an opportunity for their kids, just like Leah, and what I'm hearing as well from Tali is the opportunity of the American dream, and also to provide a better future for the kids, because what they saw, um, the landmines going off, um, they the, just, just the violence there. They said that it was just, it was so disheartening to see children with guns, to see children being forced into um, having to make a decision between uh, a life or death or becoming a, a child soldier, um, having to deal with that or watch their parents pass away. Um, so it was just so difficult for them. They, they said this was an opportunity that they wanted to have and provide for the kids and also for their daughters to know that they don't have to make that choice where it's between marriage um, at a very young age to sustain a family or to um, choose between school or a young man deciding whether they have to stay home and take care of the family um, or choose school. Instead in America, school here is, is, is readily available. Um, I know my kids now complain about it, but it's something <laughs> that, you know, they're just, for, we're fortunate to have. And then also the resources and the community and support. Um, so when they came over to America, they came over to St. Pete because that was a church that sponsored them here, but also because they loved how it was very close to the climate in which they were from so that they could have their mango trees, their le <laughs> lychees, their logans, um, all of the fruits that they would have, the fruits of the labor. And um, like I mentioned before, my dad only had a second grade education. So when he came here, it took him years to become a citizen. And I remember um, he was also um, disabled because he was shot during um, in Cambodia, um, but wow. he would ride his bike over the Bayside Bridge and folks here who are watching who know what I'm talking about, he would ride his bike over the Bayside Bridge to go to classes, ESOL classes, so that he'll be able to pass the examination and when he passed and became oh. a citizen, he was so proud and my father was this towering guy of only five foot one. So he was this, this really proud um, moment where he was just, he, it was like his um, pride just uh, was beyond um, his body. It was just great to see that. And the, the idea that you can become a citizen and the idea that you um, can work hard, even if you have a second grade education, that American dream. And I remember stories of us coming here and, um, 
going fishing and crabbing to support the family because my parents were both yeah. unable to work. And they distilled in us grit and um, the, the, the ability to persevere and go beyond mm -hmm. our means. And um, we grew up in a low housing, um, the projects in Clearwater. And I remember looking around going, um, right now, this is where I'm at, but eventually I wanna be in a situation in my life where I can give back. Cause I've had so many wonderful people in my life who um, really showed me that there's a way and mm -hmm. you just have to have the passion, um, the drive and surround yourself with great people. And I already found a good group here um, <laughs> that I'm gonna go up to Massachusetts with, but um, just, you know, just a, a tribe and really persevere and surround yourself and then help the next generation as well. So yeah. that's the, when I think of my parents' situation and, you know, they, were, they had difficulties um, where I was later placed in foster care, mm -hmm. but that in itself, the fact that they persevered and saw what they saw in Cambodia and came over to America, that in itself shows so much gumption and so much um, sacrifice. And I think yeah. that's a lot that we can kind of relate to. Um, and that's that's a story of how my parents came to, um, yeah, to America. Yeah, that is beautiful. And, you know, the love story at sea and the, from, from meeting and um, just the hardships. And thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, just a, a quick follow-up before we move on to my... Um, did you, what, what age did you start to learn about that? Because, you know, those of us who grow up in America, we often take a lot of these stories for granted as young people. And, you know, of course I did a whole documentary on my father. So his, his stuff is uh, all set in, in, in history, but you know, at some point, like what, what, what age was it when you really started to realize what a big deal this, this, this struggle was and what an amazing story it was. Well, you know, it, one thing that my parents had um, difficult with uh, was expressing their emotions. I don't know if that's a cultural thing where your parents generational yes. where they don't talk about their feelings. And um, my parents did not talk about what they experienced and what they witnessed and what they endured until later on after me poking and prying at them. Yeah. So they had a lot of uh, what I can see now in retrospect, some mental health mm -hmm. um, some issues that they really need to talk about. And it's 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 normal um, to, to have those feelings, but to have it doubled with the fact of what you witness your sister's passing away or you, you know, just, just violence like that, yeah. just extreme violence that you don't really channel or um, talk it through. Um, I remember my dad, we were eating and I might be um, aging myself, but you we would eat with the newspaper on the ground mm -hmm. and we would eat in a circle and, um, and we would sit there and eat and he would say, hurry, hurry, they're coming for us. Oh. Or hurry, hurry, the Khmer Rouge are coming. And I, I was a kid, so I was like, who are the Khmer Rouge? I don't know what you're talking about, I'm hurrying. Wow. And, or yeah. he would say, you know, eat every grain because that's all you have left. And I'm going, I don't understand. Mm -hmm. Or he'll say things like the sun doesn't wait for you. Or he'll say all these different things. Right, but, right, right. But it's, it's part of who they were because of, of the experience. And I think that showed through. And I guess that became normal for me. But then when I grew up and I realized my friends didn't have that experience, right. I start realizing that there's, there was something different. Yeah, and then yeah. they opened up a little bit more and more and more about it. And I heard from other family members of what um, the experience was like. But I would say as early as um, uh, elementary school age, mm -hmm is when it all, I start noticing things. Right. Wow. Well, thank you so much. That was, that was incredible. All right. Mai, um, tell us about your immigration. <laughs> well, um, um, lots of resonation here with, with my family's story. Um, so we're refugees, uh, Chinese from Vietnam, um, and our fam my immediate family left in uh, the early 80s, but my grandma and uncle and Arms. And my cousins actually escaped um, Vietnam through um, they by walking through Cambodia into Thailand and stayed in refugee camps in, in Thailand and eventually went to Malaysia and Philippines for uh, in, in other refugee camps and eventually got sponsored by a church <laughs> um, uh, to to Boston, Massachusetts. So there are just like lots of similarities in, in terms of the of, of of, of the map here, um, and there, um, and and my fam my immediate family, we were we were very lucky that my uncle and aunts um, made it to Boston, you know, well enough that they were able to initiate papers 
um, to uh, start the, uh, to go through the family reunification program to sponsor us. Um, so we actually flew to Thailand and stayed in the refugee camp um, in Thailand and then eventually went to the Philippines. So we, we were, I, I have a very, very special place for the Philippines because I, I, um, I spent a lot of time there um, uh, as a child in, in the camp and, you know, seeing mango trees and eating mangoes that fall directly from the trees um, and the fish and everything. I mean, it's just like we were refugees, so I had a, a great time as a child in, in the camp, but of course for the adults, they were worried to, to death uh, regarding like yeah. when they will actually get to go to America and, and be reunited without, you know, without families. But, um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was definitely, um, you know, uh, the intention was uh, uh, escaping communism and uh, the aftermath of the Vietnam War. Um, and we were looking to have a better life for, you know, for the family, especially for, you know, my generation. Uh, so myself, uh, I'm 1.5 generation, um, you know, not, not quite first generation, not quite second generation. Um, and so uh, the hardship that, you know, I, I knew of my, um, you know, of uh, my grandma, who at that time was 70 something, walk, walking on foot. Uh, through like you know experiencing Khmer Rouge and all 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 those all those you know very uh, horrifying experiences um, to to eventually get to the the camps and um, it was you know thank thankful to the UNHCR um, and the International Red Cross uh, committee of International Committee of Red Cross and Red Crescent and, and whatnot I mean that's how you know my that's how that's these are the organizations and the folks and the humanitarian workers. Um, um, who made it, you know, for me to be sitting, you know, in front of everybody here to, yeah. to, to, to be alive and flourish to, to share the experience of what it's like to have, you know, families who are refugees and, and immigrants and, um, and found, you know, opportunities and, and uh, resources in yeah. America. Um, and is that why you um, worked for the Red Cross later in life? It was exactly why I actually walked work for the Red Cross because I, I <laughs> felt that it was my way of giving back when the opportunity came. And um, and that was that was you know when I was interviewed, I said I want to give back to the Red Cross because it was the Red Cross that saved my family um, when they were in refugee camps. Excellent. Oh my goodness. I am so inspired by all of your stories right now. And um, we're going to lighten it up and talk a little bit about the biggest holiday in your culture and how it's celebrated. Uh, obviously in the Chinese culture, the Lunar New Year is the holiday of all holidays. Uh, everything shuts down. If, if, the, if the factories are closed and people aren't working, you know, it's a big deal and pretty much everything shuts down for Chinese New Year. And uh, of course, uh, from a Kung Fu standpoint, we have to work Work every Chinese New Year because we're doing the lion and the dragon and the shows and sharing parts of the culture and but on a on a bigger scale on a, a normal scale what I found regular families do because even though I'm Chinese I never celebrated like a normal Chinese person because I was always working and doing shows but apparently it's your day off and you're supposed to eat and have time with the family and and have all these it's just more of a celebration celebratory event um, and it's just a really important time for like the elders and the youth and just all of that togetherness. And, um, and we will get to food. Don't worry. I think we're going to probably spend 30 minutes at least on food later. But um, obviously for us, Lunar New Year is, is the biggest holiday. And I know that resonates with a, a lot of Asia, but not necessarily so. So um, maybe we'll start with on this time. Yeah, the biggest holiday is for us is New Year's as well. But our New Year is actually um, in April and mm -hmm. it's shared by Thailand and I want to say the Lao um, culture as well and it's also known as the uh, water festival and each country has its own a way of, of what we say New Year's um, but ours is Zhou um, Chnam which is pretty much New Year <laughs> coming into the New Year <laughs> and it's a lot of water um, you throw water you bless it's it's cleansing you go to the temples um, you uh, get cleansing from the Buddhist monks. Um, you also uh, go to your parents and you're supposed to wash their feet in a way of showing um, just remembrance of all their sacrifice. And okay. I, I, I'm noticing a, a, a trend here. It's like a respect. There's a lot of you respect your elders, you respect your family and you um, the traditions are still strong, even though some of us are more Americanized or not. Um, I feel like our traditions are still so strong. Um, it's, it's just making sure to respect your family. Um, you clean your house, um, you give 
back to the community. Uh, but then at the end of the day is have a good time. It's, it's <laughs> just, throwing a, I, I just throw water at my kids. I love, that. I love that. I'm going to start I throwing just, water at people and be yes. like, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the Cambodian thing. <laughs> It's, it's just, a, it's a lot of um, celebration. The one unique thing about the, um, the, Khmer, the Cambodian New Year versus say the Thai or um, the Laotian New Year is that we have the traditional Cambodian dancers called the Apsara dancers who are, take years of training and um, they tried to train me, but apparently my hands do not bend far back enough <laughs> and literally bend like, like, oh, like, like all the way. Like, back oh. like it touches that and apparently my uh, instructor would take the bamboo stick and go not good <laughs> and so <laughs> I got tired of hearing not good oh <laughs> my and I have no <laughs> idea what you're talking about we've never done that to either any of our students <laughs> is that why there's bamboo around your building <laughs> no there's a lot of bamboo yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I, so, oh, that's amazing. So it's, you, is it called a water festival or no? It's just, there's a no, lot. It's we yeah. We don't call it the water festival. We mm -hmm. just call it Dolce Nam. Um, mm -hmm. It's just New Year's, but it is really well known as okay. a water festival. Only right. a lot of now modern times, everyone has the water gun or yeah. the water balloons. So it's not the traditional bowls with the nice gestures. Instead, it's like, bam. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, we, we have to change with the time. So they, yes. we've got water guns. Why would we use a small bowl when you get home, have a super soaker? Oh my gosh. That sounds like so much fun. Well, I want to jump to Mai actually, because of course she celebrates Chinese new year, but I know in Vietnam, um, they do Tet and, and we often go and celebrate with the Vietnamese community here in Orlando, which we have a very strong, uh, Vietnamese community. And so it's so nice to see them in the traditional clothing. Um, you know, cause of course for Chinese new year, you it's, it's, it's like slightly different. There's a lot of similarities, um, but of course, it's it's a lot of good luck. It's a lot about the red envelopes. <laughs> of course, I'm in that, you know, non-receiving phase because I'm married already. It's like just the kids or the unmarried or until you're an elder, you get you get the red envelopes and you you pat, you know, you, you share the good luck. But maybe you could share a little bit about the um, what the Vietnamese culture does for for the Lunar New Year. So if that's the most famous, I mean, maybe I don't know. Sure. Um, so Vietnam also uses the lunar calendar. So we, we, we do share the same date for New Year celebration and uh, it's known as Tat. Um, and um, I would have to say that uh, because our family is uh, more Buddhist or non-Catholic, um, our celebration has, uh, that celebration has a lot to do with going to temples. Oh. Um, and um Besides like waking up and getting your, uh, let's say from, you know, the parents and, and all that, um, and the whole cleaning house and all that very similar to Chinese culture, but uh, going to as many temples on the new year day as possible is, is like receiving as many blessings as you can uh -huh. for the first day of the new year. So it will cover the entire year. Um, and um and so that's like what I grew up with in, in, in remembering like what that is like, is, is like lots of incense and lots of smoke in the eyes and <laughs> uh, lots of like charity work because, you know, when you go to temples, like you, you do a lot of, you know, you do your donations and, 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 uh, and more, but um, there's also another thing uh, could be more family, but I, I, I think it's, it's very, it's very cultural as well for uh, uh, how Vietnam celebrates New Year's that we will come together and gamble. Uh, it, it's, it's like playing uh, cards yeah. <laughs> or, or, um, or, um, just, just different things, you know, and it's, it's, it's like, it's like a, not a big kind of like go to the case casino, but it's really families, uh, friends gathering to like, you know, like play with coins and things like that because everybody gets money, right? The kids right. also have money. <laughs> so we would play like, you know, um, like gal and things like that. So, so just like kids get very, very excited because they have their own money and they can, <laughs> They can kind of play cards together with yeah. the families and they almost consider a little, you know, resourceful and rich. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, celebration of that is, uh, is all about uh, families coming together um, and also gifting. So that's kind of like a, the art of, you know, gi uh, gifting. Um, uh, exchanges of like, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll bring like and, and uh, uh, no, and uh, and flowers and things like that. And so you go from house to house and, you know, you give to me and then I give to you. And, uh, uh, and, and there's a tradition of um, making your own, your own bantek. Um, uh, is like sticky rice. Okay. Um, that's like wrapped with like, you know, uh, banana leaves and, and, um, oh, okay. and, mm -hmm. um, 
and like you know organic whatever is made of the, like the, the strings right so it's like usually the edge of the banana leaves like they use it to okay wrap. like a twine like a twine yeah yeah like a twine yeah so it's it's um it's a uh, it's very very I, I say it's very heartful like you know um people set time aside to make food and to make you know homemade uh, meals and things like that uh, specialties to to bring to uh, families and friends and um yeah and and also to wear new clothes new clothes is like a huge huge thing for for that celebration like no matter what it's like you you get to make new clothes mm -hmm. and back when i was a kid in you know in vietnam like that's when you know almost that time we all can and hopefully you know the family has enough like money to to have everybody in the family gets a new set of clothes and shoes, uh, slippers, not shoes, slippers, because we wear uh, slippers, flip flops most of the time, and right. they're, not, they're not like sneakers or anything. <laughs> right. Nowadays it's different, right? But back right. when I was a kid, then yeah, yeah, it's like new shoes and new clothes, new year. That's yeah. like everything about that. <laughs> I love it. I love what you said about the incense because there is something about you know we talk about when you think of memory, your olfactories are like the the strongest sense, and that smell of incense but for us as in in the chinese new year it's firecrackers we go home just like smelling like we have exploded basically because it's just firecrackers all day all night and it's so that it can scare away all the evil spirits and get rid of all of the bad um well, so that's I, why I, there's firecrackers i would like to add that yeah firecrackers is a huge practice it's big for the, there's yeah for the vietnamese community uh and you probably will see that in you know for the vietnamese american community as well and mm -hmm. they're, they're not afraid to spend money on firecrackers nope like that they i think they want more firecrackers yes. than even the lion they're yes. like how many yes. rolls can i get i want yes. eight you know yes. and it's it's, and it's it's about like us you know if you have the longest burning firecrackers yes food, it's like it shows like you know wealth and it shows like you know yes. um, uh the, the the power right to, to yeah. stay away as, as Definitely. much of the evil i get a lot of how many firecrackers are they doing yeah how many yeah, firecrackers yeah. Are they doing and i I, you know? I have to mention this because my name is named after this flower um in 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 vietnam the plum flower is actually yellow so it's bong mai, right? Bong mai is the yellow plum flower. Okay. Um, and so um, that's why if you, you know, nowadays, if you go to like Vietnamese uh, restaurants and you see kind of like these yellow plum flowers, they're fake, like plastic ones, but they're, you know, they're everywhere or that they're usually in decorations or in artwork for a Vietnamese culture. Um, the yellow plum flower is, is a huge part of that celebration. And okay. the fact that I was born almost close to that my mom named me Mai because when she went to give birth to me, it was everywhere along the road when she, you know, on her way oh, to the hospital. Yeah. The hospital. So totally. then she's like, I came out a girl and she's like, okay, Mai. <laughs> it's a good thing. Mai. It would have been a kind of rough if you were a boy being named after the flower, but yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> but it signified like I was born near that. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Okay, Tally. What is the biggest um, culture? Which 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 culture? Uh, uh, like, maybe the Japanese culture. Well, obviously, I mean, I was uh, in Rio for uh, Carnival, but <laughs> yes, yes, that's the biggest Brazilian um, right. holiday celebration. Is crazy mm -hmm. so what we do is well different from what you see usually on tv for real carnival what we do as kids just kind of like halloween kind of mm -hmm. so we dress up in costumes and we don't go out asking for candy we just go to like dance parties yep. and like social clubs or in your neighborhood because the whole country is just like dancing and partying for seven days oh yeah basically. yeah so um it's yeah, pretty wild <laughs> it goes it gets wild and there's so many different kinds of carnival if you ever have an interest in in researching because brazil is so big right it's kind of yes. like the, the size of the u.s so yes it's lot. so for example it, it it has like a, a texan carnival and then a new orleans carnival and mm. then a floridian carnival so there's so many different types and some are like just street dancing and then some are parades mm -hmm. and then some like umbrella uh, dancing. So it is, it's very different. I'm from the South. We kind of suck in carnival. <laughs> Sorry, but um, it is, it's just not, I don't know, because the South is colder and we just don't have that, you know, beach lifestyle. It's right. just, it's colder. It's more like, 
I don't know, mountains. And so mm -hmm. our carnivals are not great. Um, but <laughs> you got to go up, up, up further north. Up yeah, you have to go like Sao Paulo Did, and Rio. Yes, you yes, know, like, of course. My husband's is from like kind of in the, as I said, southwest, yeah. southeast, uh, middle of the country. Even him in his hometown, they have a great um, carnival, but it's so different because they're they're far away from, right. from the beach. Okay. Uh, from the coast so they're more like mountains and waterfalls mm -hmm. kind of carnival which is so I and, and, of oh, course, cool. <laughs> and street partying of course yeah um but and then on my sorry go ahead no no, no. i was just going to ask did you also celebrate any i know like you said you didn't have any japanese language growing up because there was like the generations yeah. of oppression of that but yeah. did they maintain any of the traditions yeah. even though you're in Brazil? Yeah. so i grew up going to a japanese community club oh. um yeah so and then they celebrated um hanamatsuri which is like the the spring festival but which coincides with the immigration anniversary of japanese immigration to brazil so kind of was like celebrating spring and celebrating the immigration and mm -hmm. yeah so with games and that was one of my favorites because there were some pretty intense like running games and we would get prizes and yeah, that was that was really fun. Um, so yeah, I kind of grew up like going to carnival and also going to uh, Japanese celebrations, Hanamatsuri. Nice. So you get the best of both worlds. I yeah. love it. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh. Thank you. All right, Leah. Okay. <laughs> um, so the biggest holiday in the Philippines is Christmas, and um, and that's probably because we have a lot of Spanish influences. Mm -hmm. um, in 1500, Ferdinand Magellan came and um, colonized, um, you know, had Spanish coloni colonies. And so Catholicism and the, the, Sp the Spanish influences unified the country. And so about 80% of Filipinos are Catholic and they're like the highest amount of Asians that are, um, are Christian. And so they celebrate, like, Filipinos love Christmas. They start celebrating it as early as December 16th and they do an early mass called um, Misa de Gallo. And then um, Christmas Eve is called, it's a big celebration called Noche Buena. And that is, um, which translates to big celebration. Um, but they're your family, your friend's family, your friend's friends, they all come over and they come and eat and celebrate. And um, sometimes they have what's called a Kamayan feast and they have like a huge spread of food and then you eat with your hands and um, you know, it's just huge. And so we end up celebrating Christmas up until the first or second week of January. And so that's <laughs> like our You guys take thing. Christmas into a month. It's Christmas, like a month of Christmas. <laughs> Right. So, but I do appreciate Lunar New Year. Uh, we didn't really, the Filipinos aren't really celebrated, but we, I, we love celebrating Chinese and Vietnamese and um, the new year and getting the red envelopes. And all of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, why not? Really like, fun. you're like, Hey, we're Asian red envelopes. <laughs> <laughs> so I love that. It works. Oh my gosh. So are the word other than, I mean, cause Christmas is pretty traditional. All of us being Asian American know about Christmas and I actually grew up Catholic. And so, um, yeah, you get the mass and all of that, but it was, are there any differences in the Filipino culture of Christmas that you would say is different other than the whole one month thing? I don't know if, if that's so <laughs> traditional, but is there anything really specific, um, that, that kind of differs from what maybe an American would celebrate in Christmas that you would say other than the food? Cause that's always different. Um, no, but I mean, um, you know, growing up, I, we had a lot of masses in Tagalog because it's just so big there. So I remember going to um, mass and it was just like half of what was in Tagalog and half of, half of it was in English. And so mm -hmm. it was just, just a big thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to jump into food now because we are, we are running out of time. And I want to talk about this Kamayan because I, of course, I was in Toronto when I had my first Kamayan uh, restaurant experience. And it had like the guys that came out with the drum and the whole, you know, I don't know if that's even traditional, if that was like being at the Polynesian at Disney or what, you know, like or when you go to like these theme restaurants or if it was like actually legit. But yeah, they put these leaves down and then just put a ton of food in front of you and then you just like go at it but um maybe you could share like the real deal or or some of the traditional foods and um your favorite your favorite foods from the culture sure um yeah so um 
that's kind of exactly what it is, the Khmerian feast. Is they, they spread it on leaves, they have like rice and, and our favorite dishes. So um, our traditional like formal foods that we always cook is pancit. Um, that's kind of um, derived from, you know, Chinese lo mein. And um, so we always cook that. And there's three types of um, pancit. So depending on the noodle, there's um, pancit by, by bihon, which is like a thinner noodle. And then there's pancit canton, which is a thicker. And you can put, um, you know, whatever meat, pork, chicken, um, you know, cabbage, carrots, everything in there. Um, and another favorite is um, lumpia, which is also, um, <laughs> you know, derived from like a, the Chinese spring roll. And so um, we cook, you know, the, the lumpia and the pancit, those are our, our major favorite ones. And another favorite is um, adobo. So that's also kind of derived from Spanish foods, but um, it's, um, you can cook it usually with chicken, but um, the main ingredient that makes it Filipino is that you you, you put vinegar um, with to make it that tangy, sour type of um, taste for um, the chicken adobo. So and then you put it over rice. Um, so that's also a favorite. And another one, which it's not my favorite, but it's my sister's. It's called sinigang. And it's kind of like a sour soup um, made out of tamarind. And okay. um, there's, you can put um, guava, uh, eggplant, and they usually put chicken and you put it over rice. But everything is always included with steamed rice in the Philippines. And I don't know if that's the same everywhere, but um, that is their major thing. And I remember going to um, Las Vegas and, and going there, this is the first time I, you know, I guess just didn't realize it, but um, going to a buffet and wondering like, you know, it was breakfast time and I was asking my mom, I'm like, where's the rice? <laughs> like, this is so <laughs> weird <laughs> because we had it with everything. But, um, and I will say though, there are a couple of places in Central Florida, if you want to check it out, um, they have a Michael Colantes. He is an amazing chef and he um, opened up the restaurant Taglish and he has another couple of restaurants coming up. They also have Jollibee's in um, the UCF area, which is kind of like a fast food restaurant. And it's really, really funny because, um, so they do like a Filipino type of spaghetti and they include hot dogs. Oh, <laughs> and, okay. <laughs> And so and maybe it's because like it's in the UCF area. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, uh, I think so. But they also I mean, it's actually a chain in the Philippines. So mm -hmm. Jollibee oh, okay. is huge. Like they have fried chicken. and It's called Chicken Joy. And that's like their thing. But mm -hmm. they also include spaghetti with the hot dog. And I always tell Scott, I'm like my husband. And when he cooks spaghetti, I'm like, add, add, you know, add the hot dogs. And he's like, what? <laughs> like, no, it's, it's really You're like, thing. it's traditional. <laughs> don't, it's my culture. I need this. <laughs> yes. I so love it. I love it. Things, I, so I had I said off air earlier, I said, man, I really missed an opportunity here. Like we should have been having this in person with all of our traditional okay. foods, talking and eating and enjoying that together. So next episode, that's definitely what we're going to do. Okay. Um, uh, my, let, uh, let's talk about me, me. Yes. Can I just um, jump in really quick? Um, this is how Fusion Pass started. Uh, we just, Terry, my boss, started meeting a lot of people from different cultures. And our first gathering was a potluck. <laughs> and then people started talking about different like things and aspects. And I'm like, okay, so every month we need to do this around like dance, music, arts and crafts and poetry, but always starting with a potluck. So, <laughs> you know, great things start with food at a potluck. That's right. That's right. All my, my podcast listeners know, like every two episodes, I talk about my plan for world peace, which is like a giant potluck because we can all agree on one thing is that we love food and we can, we can gather around that. So that's, that's always my thing. But um, my, I mean, we have a huge Vietnamese community here in Orlando and I've heard our food's pretty legit. I've been to Vietnam. So, but um, please share your favorites and um, you know, what, what's traditional in your home when it comes to food and the Vietnamese culture um one of the things that I always miss uh, when I go back to Vietnam is that for breakfast it is like everything all the choices it's not just like oh you know the entrees that usually people would have for dinner it's breakfast so that's why like when Larry was talking about rice I mean we eat rice for breakfast and it's it's considered common and normal you, we can, we eat like a big bowl of pho for breakfast it's not like you know 
just like toast or or just eggs or whatnot it's just like it's a full-on meal and um we eat dessert for breakfast so it's like eating like you go out to the um what we got get yeah which is like kind of like the, the outdoor you know like supermarket uh, market and um and you know food is like on one side and groceries on the other side right and so we would eat yeah yeah it's like the sweet you know kind of like sometimes it's sticky rice sometimes it's like whatever um but it's like whatever you feel that day when you wake up um we don't cook breakfast at home and it's usually going out to eat and it, it supports the local economy right so mm -hmm. that there's like you know they're um your moms and pops like little shop right in front of their 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 homes and doors and things like that so they just serve breakfast and yeah. uh, or or food and that's considered breakfast so usually everybody goes out for breakfast we there's really not a practice to to cook breakfast at home well it sounds a little impossible like being the chef in my home i'm like wait you expect me to make all of the entree yeah. dishes that would normally be once in a week all at one time in the morning that sounds kind of uh that kind of kind of t difficult but um but so but basically like pho and, well, and, those and are but, like, but what i like what i like is actually ban hoi ban hoi is a, a it's a similar to it's a smaller vermicelli that's usually like kind of like weed together right so it's like white noodle into a um into kind of like a, a like netty like it's like in a, like patty mm -hmm. um and, and it's vermicelli really but it's just very thin and um and you eat it with nook mum, which is the, the fish sauce, right? And and it serves with like, you know, um, spring roll, the ya ya and uh, tat nung, which is like the real pork and or beef. Uh, and so I like that. I, I, I also like goi. Goi is like the Vietnamese salad, right? So mm -hmm. I like the goi do do, which is the green papaya salad. Um, and, uh, um, you know, very Southeast Asian flavor, flavoring mm -hmm. and things like that. But uh, but yeah, I, I just love the freshness of the ingredients. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of herbs, lot, lots of um, um, greens and um, and really just eating from the land um, um, right onto the plate. Uh, lots of seafood for Vietnamese food uh, yeah. because it's, it's, it's this peninsula, part of a mm -hmm. peninsula. So, uh, you know, um, Lots of seafood, lots of like fish and 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 uh, shellfish and yeah. Um, I think I, we're all and, getting hungry now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I especially you oh like shell, shellfish. Like I especially love the little kind of like corner stalls where they have like clams and mm -hmm. snails and you know everything else. okay we're, we're gonna write all this down and for the next one well when we go to boston we have our hit list for you to take us to, to make sure oh, you I, uh, yeah food. there's some oh really good there's some really good vietnamese restaurants yes, um yes on Dor Dor dorchester f in dorchester. excellent excellent all right uh let's jump to tally Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> I grew up eating both foods, Brazilian and Japanese, but I wasn't like quite a fan of sushi or any of the Japanese food until I was older. Um, but yeah, grew up, you know, you all know this <laughs> <laughs> food. And um, as far as Brazilian, you know, it's the basic Latin food. So lots of rice and beans, the basic, the staples are rice and beans, um, either beef or chicken and salad. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I don't know, I think one of my favorites, like my grandma's uh, tempura that I loved, that it was the only way I would eat like vegetables when I was little. <laughs> Fried. That she, would make this, <laughs> she would make me lots of tempura, my mom too. And um, yeah, and my mom is a great cook. Not that she, uh, I mean, She's she always worked um, her whole life, always, you know, had a career, but she loved cooking for us because she wanted, you know, um, there was this special love and coming from a mom. And I think I really got this from her. I'm always thinking about food. Uh, and I was just talking to my husband the other day and how I'm always, I finish a meal. I'm like, okay, so what are we having for dinner? Do I need to go to the store? <laughs> so it's, it's a constant for me. Um, but yeah, I really miss my mom. She's in Brazil. And I feel like the first thing that I'll ask her to make when she comes over is rice with chicken, um, which is really special. And you can find, if you go to Brazil, of course, you can find rice with chicken, um, of different kinds everywhere you go. Um, but I think one of the most traditional dishes, sorry, I exaggerated a little bit. Um, this is how much I miss my family, you know, because oh, of the pandemic, no, of course, they haven't been course. able, I haven't seen my family in so long um, because, you know, borders are closed. So anyway, um, uh, 
what is really traditional in Brazil and what I would recommend if you go to a Brazilian restaurant is to try uh, feijoada, which is the black beans and with pork meat. Um, it's like a stew, but they cook it for several hours. And this has really like African roots. So um, it is pretty amazing. It's one of the most traditional foods. And we usually eat that on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. Usually go to a restaurant with live music, like live samba, and uh, eat that with really thin chopped kale, which is like stir fried with bacon, onions, uh, garlic, and white rice, of course. <laughs> See, no matter what, we are all strung together by rice. <laughs> by rice. I think exactly. that is going to resonate in here. And of course, you know, in both yeah. my Chinese and Jamaican roots, there are rices, rices involved oh, as well. And it's, yeah, yeah, it's really important. It's it's an important food. Uh, so <laughs> I had a food expert on my show and she said like, if there was, I asked her, what was one food that could bring everyone together. And she initially said rice, but then she took it back because she goes, everyone is so specific about the rice. There could be an argument over, no, my rice is the, <laughs> the right one or the this is how you cook it because everybody likes it a little bit different. But um, OK, we're going to jump to on now who misses her Cambodian food because we were just talking earlier off air and Mai is going to a Cambodian restaurant that we don't have here in Orlando. And so share with us on what is she going to eat that we will not be. <laughs> Um, so anyone here watching who want to bring Cambodian food to Central Florida, please do, because you'll have a lot of fans starting with me and my family. We would love that. <laughs> and then Maya will have to just fly down and hang out with us. Um, <laughs> so some of the food that um, is really traditional is nompochok, which is like a noodle dish with fish. Um, there's also uh, a mamok, which is um, fish with curry and um, some other spices as well. I, I teeter towards the more Vietnamese Cambodian dishes only mm -hmm. because that's where um, my roots are from, where we have, so we have um, a mixture of, so in Vietnamese it's called tikal, but in Khmer it's called um, khao sa truk. So that's pretty much um, caramelized pork with eggs in it. Sometimes you put bamboo shoots in it and some, um, some people do different things, but we would do the bamboo shoots. And that was always so delicious because it's always like a, when you think of a home cooked meal, you think of um, that kind of dish. Um, mm. I also like, um, gosh, now I'm salivating. I know, <laughs> I think we all are. <laughs> you know, the, um, uh, my, you probably know this one. This is called, we call it nom croit, which is like pretty much it's a, we call in translation, it means um, orange uh, dessert, but in reality, it's just a sesame ball on the outside or a, a ball with sesame seeds on the mm -hmm. outside and there's the uh, mung bean inside of it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's um, sold here at Tiang Hun at all, all the grocery stores, but also given out during the holidays. Um, there's also Bang Jung that I love so much, so, so much. It's during the holidays and um, it's the rice, um, glutinous rice and then there's a uh, pork in the middle and it's wrapped around with uh, banana leaf um, and I, I, I'm trying to recall <laughs> what we call it, but I there's such a huge uh, Vietnamese community here that I just go in and I just say uh, my favorite uh, Vietnamese foods I, I literally just go in and go um, bánh chung or bánh yu tiên. I just speak like so, certain key important Vietnamese words because that's it it's always about food or money <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think when it comes to language, it's one of the first things that gets adapted because like if we go to dim sum, okay, I can order everything before I would, was able to speak anything in Chinese, right? Like you just know because it's survival. You want to eat and drink and, and have all of these wonderful things. And um, I just love it. I love all the diversity and the different foods because it's what's amazing is even though there's that commonality amongst all these different Asian foods, they're so specific to... Um, to each region that even between Cambodia and Vietnam, as close as they are, there sounds like there's some distinct differences and, and, you know, specificity, not only in the region, but like in terms of family too, because each family has their own recipe. And um, of course in China, it's such a huge country that, you know, the North and the South, they eat very different. You know, I think because we're from more Southern, we are rice, you know, up North, they're more about noodles and then the bread, the, the bows. Um, but, but um, yeah, yeah, food is my favorite topic of all time. And um, I know we are coming on dinner time for all of you here. So we're unfortunately going to have to wrap up and we'll have to pick this up again and have a, a part two of the conversation where we just talk about dessert. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 
is a bit, um, but yeah, I think, I think that it is something that definitely binds us all together. But one thing that did resonate amongst what I heard from everybody was uh, how important it was as, as either yourselves or your parents or your grandparents, like for them to make the journey to be here for the opportunity in America, somewhere that was going to be diverse and accepting of all people and somewhere that you would have the opportunity, even if you started with nothing. And, and, and sounds like, you know, a lot of, a lot of us here have similar roots, if, if not rooted ourselves in, in poverty and, and starting from nothing, working really hard through determination and hard work and really kind of paying paving the way and, and getting that education. And, um, and I think that's just something that's really amazing because every Asian American I've ever met has this amazing story to share. And it's one of the reasons I started my podcast because I said, wow, so many people have so many interesting stories to share and we can learn so much from one another and learn to respect one another and learn to appreciate one another. And um, at the very least be introduced to each other's foods and culture. And uh, I think that's a really beautiful thing. So um, yeah, I do not want to keep any of you much longer today. So thank you all so much for joining me today, uh, having this really, really valuable conversation. And hopefully it was a lot of fun for you and a little bit lighter. And cheers to all of you, my lovely ladies. You are, you are a fantastic guest. So please, please come back again. And um, thank you so much for being on the Sifu Mimi Chan show. And listeners, I hope you enjoyed this chat. If not, I did. So <laughs> we'll, we'll leave it at that. So thank you all so much. And we'll see you next time. That's all for today's episode. Thanks for listening to the Sifu Mimi Chan Show. Please subscribe and rate my podcast on your platform of choice and leave a review. You can become a patron of the show at patreon.com slash Sifu Mimi Chan to help keep this podcast going. Follow me and interact on social media at Sifu Mimi Chan on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook.